Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Paul says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your family, which is named in heaven, here gathered together to draw near to you as a priesthood of believers who will offer up sacrifice of praise and worship because of your great salvation and redemption in our lives. Thank you for counting us righteous in your presence and giving us a high priest through whom we can draw near to you and worship you and praise you and fellowship with you and commune with you in your presence and even with one another here. Thank you, Father, for your precious word that you've given to your people, to the church, which is to be the pillar and ground of truth. May your truth be upheld even in this place. May we be an example of the foundation of truth, even to this community, to our family and to those outside of the faith. May we, may we be the manifestation of the manifold wisdom of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, as the word goes forth today, may you bless each of us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to respond to the word of your grace. Thank you, we pray and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's a, an honor and a privilege to be invited to minister the word. Um, this morning I want to share with you something that has been on my heart, something I've been meditating on for the past uh, month and a half, I think. I've been drawing a lot of encouragement and strength from this passage that was just read in your hearing, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And I trust that uh, you will be also encouraged, blessed, as well as challenged. I've entitled this uh, sermon, Walking in Christ as Lord. Walking in Christ as Lord. Now, the context of this passage, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, um, is quite interesting. This is the first exhortation that Paul gives to the Christians, to the saints in Colossae. Um, Paul wrote this epistle while he was in a prison in Rome. And while there, he was visited by a fellow minister named Epaphras, who came uh, presumably to visit Paul and seek counsel and direction, as well as encouragement, because years before that, he had been the one used by God to plant the church in Colossae. Paul had never been to uh, Colossae. He had never seen these Christians, but he had heard about it in prison there in Rome, Epaphras began to share with him the challenges that his people, whom he had planted in the gospel, were facing, primarily the influence of false teaching and false teachers. And so, Paul, hearing of their faith and their love in Christ, began to worship and thank the Lord as he customarily did, and he also began to pray for them. And you see this in the first chapter of Colossians. He prays for them. And his prayer is very significant because what he includes in his prayer for them is what he is going to enforce in the rest of his epistle. You'll find that Paul plants the seed thoughts of his themes and his great subject matter that he's going to address to these Christians in his prayer. And uh, one of the things he prayed about in chapter 1 is that they would not only be filled with the knowledge of God's will in spiritual wisdom and understanding, but here's the important thing, so that they walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing um, unto him, bearing fruits in every good work and increasing in the knowledge 
of the Lord. And he's going to follow up on that as he addresses the issues that they are facing. Now, one of the things Epaphras shared with Paul was this great challenge that the people in Colossae were vulnerable to false teachers. They were being persuaded to things outside of the gospel of Christ. And Paul writes this letter to address that issue. You'll see this in chapter 2. After he talks about his apostolic ministry, and interestingly, he's never seen them. They have never seen him. But he says, I'm struggling for you, that you might come to a unity and also a maturity in the faith. He is struggling for them even though he's never seen them. He's never had face-to-face -face contact with them. They are not acquainted with, with him, but he assures them that he is there with them in spirit. And he says in chapter 2, I, verse 4, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. This is the real purpose of why Paul is writing. And he's going to send this letter with various fellow gospel workers back to Colossae. From what he has heard from Epaphras, he's going to send this letter back to build them up, to challenge them, to encourage them to stay steadfast in Christ. Now, interestingly, um, many commentators have tried to put together a picture of the delusion, the deceptive teaching and influences that have been swaying the Colossian Christians and some commentators, many commentators have difficulty because it is a, 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 a mixture, a blend of uh, asceticism, mysticism, legalism, some Jewish, some Hellenistic, some Gnostic or pre-Gnostic in that sense. Um, and Paul, when he addresses their vulnerability to false teachings, he does something quite interesting. It's like going to a doctor. You have a specific ailment or illness, and the doctor gives you counsel about how to take care of yourself in a holistic sense. In a sense in which, hmm, if I practice these principles, I will remain whole and sound. And Paul does this more than simply diving into detail in addressing the false teachings. He does address the false teachings in this epistle. But more than anything else, he brings them back to the very heart of what it is to live as Christians. And so that is what I want us to focus on today. It not only has application for those who are being persuaded to false teaching, but in general, it is the general principle of the New Testament, how to live and to walk in Christ as you ought to as Christians. And so walking in Christ as Lord is the subject and the topic of this sermon. Now, Paul, before he comes to any exhortation, to any command for them to live and to walk in a certain manner, he lays the groundwork, and this is what was read in your hearing this morning by Brother Randy, the hymn of Christ that Pastor Christian preached on several weeks ago before Christmas in the Advent season. The hymn of Christ in chapter 1 of Colossians, verses 15 through 20. I won't go through the detail there. I trust that Pastor Christian did a very thorough job exegeting the passage regarding the preeminence and the superiority of Christ. But what Paul is doing here is he's revealing in this Christ hymn the inseparable connection between Christ's lordship and his redeeming work. What Paul is emphasizing here is that if Christ is not Lord, he cannot save. There is no such thing as salvation without his lordship. Salvation is actually a consequence of Christ's lordship. There's no salvation but lordship salvation. So, you know, years ago we had the debate about whether Christ can simply be your savior and not your lord. The scriptures do not teach any such thing. Here you see in the hymn of Christ in chapter 1, when Paul lays the foundation for Christ's supremacy and 
preeminence, he says he's not only the head over all creation, he's Lord, all things exist in him and by him and for him, but he's also the head of the new creation. The church being the first of the new creation. He himself the beginning of the new creation. The firstborn from the dead. He is Lord not only of all things, but also of the new creation. So, and then Paul amplifies this and says, It is him who reconciles all things on, on earth and in heaven by the blood of his cross. So here you see him also, not only Lord, preeminent, superior, and supreme over all things, ruling and reigning over all things, over all creation and the new creation, but he's also the redeemer, the savior, through the blood of his cross. So he's both Lord and Christ. And in this epistle, Paul shows the connection here. Look at he, uh, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Even in his introduction, he tells the Colossians, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's lordship. That's dominion, authority, and lordship. Christ has delivered us. Or God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. That is the exercise of lordship and authority and power. And in the same breath, he says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's, that's redemption. Lordship, power and authority, deliverance and redemption forgiveness of sins then in chapter 2 Paul will go on he's speaking about the redemptive work of Christ on the cross and he says in chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 by canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands he set aside he, uh, this he set aside nailing it to his cross that's redemption that's how you are forgiven of your sins. He is the Redeemer. Now in the same breath, verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That's lordship. That's dominion. And so often, the Christ that Christians receive at the beginning of their Christian life is not lordship or lord and redeemer. There is a separation. And so many professing Christians will say, I, I believe I'm forgiven of my sins. And yet they continue enslaved in certain areas of bondage. Christ delivers, and when he delivers, he forgives. Vice versa, whom he forgives, he delivers. It is an anomaly if people say, I'm forgiven of all my sins, but they continue enslaved in certain areas of bondage. You'll find that. Read through the Gospels. Wherever Jesus delivered people, he said, go in peace. Your sins are forgiven you. And wherever he forgives, he delivers also. He is both Lord, deliverer, and redeemer. There was a prophecy given to the prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah's day, in which he was to speak to the high priest Joshua. And uh, this is what he says in Zechariah 6, verses 12 and 13. It says, Say to him, to Joshua the high priest, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. That never came to pass in Israel's day. In Joshua's day, uh, in, in Zechariah's day, where Joshua was the, was the high priest, it never came to pass. That prophecy was never fulfilled. It only became a fulfillment when the Messiah came into the world. He died. He rose again. He ascended to heaven, sat at the right hand of God. And there you see a king and a priest joined together in one, the office of king, of lordship, and the office of redeemer, all in one person, fulfilled 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. How often do we receive Christ or do people receive Christ in only half of Christ, only as Savior, only as Redeemer, but not as Deliverer? Paul said, no, he has delivered you from the domain of darkness in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So Paul lays the foundation for the Colossians. He says, this is, this is the Lord Christ. He is Lord and he is Redeemer. And as he comes to chapter 2, he lays the first exhortation to them and some commentators believe this exhortation is the main exhortation it's it's the main part of the the body of the epistle that goes from this passage Colossians 2 verses 6 and 7 all the way to chapter 4 verse 6 it includes the main body of the epistle but he starts here with the the greatest exhortation of the epistle. All other exhortations that follow can be subsumed under this. And Paul had a, a way of saying things where he lays the main point, the real issue of the Colossian Christians being persuaded or vulnerable to false teaching had to do with the issue of lordship. And so he lays this exhortation as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, or in other translations, as the Lord, your Lord, so walk in him. I want to I spend time just taking apart verses 6 and part of verse 7. I told Pastor Christian, as I was invited to speak on this, I had attempted to preach the whole passage to you, but... As I looked over my notes, and my wife looked over the notes and said, Dominic, this is too much to give the people. So I told Pastor Christian, I, I think I'll break this down into two sermons. So this is just sermon one that I'm going to uh, share with you today. But look at, look at verse six. I want to unwrap uh, the understanding behind verse six first. He says, therefore, he has been building up to the supremacy and preeminence of Christ and now he says, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. This is how he's going to address their vulnerability to false teachings and being persuaded into delusions. How? Come back to what you have heard and received in the beginning. Isn't that what the Apostle John says in his epistle? Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, you will abide in the Father and the Son. Interestingly, the emphasis is on the beginning. And your beginning in the Christian life is very important. For the Apostle Paul, this is what happened in the beginning. As you have received Christ as Lord or as your Lord... You are to continue living according to what you heard and what you received in the beginning. Now, that has tremendous implications for living the Christian life. But I want to I try and take apart this verse word for word or phrase for phrase. See the word received? It is not a passive receive. You know, like somebody gives you a gift like at Christmas, you receive a gift. You're passive, you know, it just falls into your hands, falls into your lap. That word is in no way passive. The Greek word there, interestingly, is in the active aorist tense. Aorist means definitively, once for all, not repeated and continuing. You once for all receive Christ. But the receiving is not a passive tense. In the Greek, it is an active tense. Let me illustrate that. The, the Greek word there that Paul uses um, is the word paralambano. Two parts to that Greek word. Para means alongside, like parallel lines, two lines alongside each other. Para, lambano means to take to oneself. It is an active sense, not 
somebody give you a gift and oh, it just lands into your lap. It's not a passive sense. It is an active taking. And so paralambano means definitively laying hold of something so that it is always with you by your side and having a close influence on you always wherever you go, whatever you do. You ever thought of that? Look at how John uses the word in the Gospel of John. Chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. That's the word paralambano. Now, I'm sure they did not passively reject Christ. Paralambano is an active word. You can only reject a person actively. Read the Gospels, and you'll see that the unbelieving Jews actively rejected Christ. They didn't just Sit there or stand there passively rejecting. Paralimbano is an active taking or refusing to take. And on the flip side, verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. To all who did receive him, John uses the same root from the Greek, lambano, to all who did take him unto themselves. So it is an active word, not a passive word. Jesus himself uses it in the active sense. In John 14, verse 3. Look at John 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may you may be also. Paralambano, I will take you. He didn't just stand by and passively say, I'm going to receive you to myself. I will take you. So salvation is a sovereign work of God in which he initiates grace in you, but you respond actively and you take him to yourself. How many of us have taken the Lord and he remains on a shelf? Or on the side, not paralambano, not by our side. Always, wherever I go, wherever, whatever I do, he's not always there by my side, but he's there in a place, and we sometimes forget where he is. And we only appeal to him when we need him. Paul said, as you have received, as you have paralambano, taken him. Look at what David says in Psalm 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. David took the Lord to be his Lord by his side always. Paralambano. And Paul begins with this indicative. This is true of you, saints in Colossae, as you have taken Christ as your Lord. Now he begins the exhortation. So walk in him. Let me take apart that word walk. It is a common word in the New Testament used most often by Paul, but also by the other writers in the New Testament. The word walk is the word peripateo in the Greek. Let me separate that. Two parts to the word walk. Peri means around, like periphery, like perimeter. Peri. Pateo is to tread or trample on a path, to walk in a way that encompasses or circumscribes your whole life. Parry Patel, walk in a manner that you surround and encircle and circumscribe every area of your life in the realm and sphere of Christ's Lordship. And many Christians, they will not parry Patel. They will go here and in one area, they will cut around and not enclose it in the sphere and realm of the Lordship of Christ. Paul is saying, no, I want you to walk in a manner that surrounds and encompasses and encircles the whole of your life in the sphere and realm of Christ's Lordship. Pretty encompassing, right? This is the exhortation. This is the main exhortation. All other exhortations in Colossians can be subsumed under this exhortation. 
He goes to the main heart of the issue, the heart of the issue, why you're open to delusions and influences extraneous to the gospel is because of the issue of lordship. Who is your Lord? And if he is your Lord, are you walking in a manner that circumscribes the whole of your life in the realm of his lordship? That is the sense that the apostle is conveying to the Colossian Christians. Now, a couple of things to understand about verse 6. Verse 6 is a prime example of the pattern of New Testament ethics and New Testament sanctification. You want to know how to walk in sanctification and holiness? Colossians 2 verse 6 is a pattern. You'll see this pattern all over the New Testament, primarily in the Apostle Paul, but also in the other apostles. You see, the rule of the Christian life is not just the commandments, not just a list of rules and a code of ethics. The rule of the Christian life is actually a person. You receive Christ the Lord, walk in Him. He is the source, he is the rule of your life. The reality of who you are in Christ is the rule of the Christian life. Look at Galatians 6, verses 15 and 16. Look at what Paul says to the Galatians. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. That's who you are. You are a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, Peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. You say, what rule? What rule? Commandments? There are commandments. There are exhortations involved. But it is the reality of who you are in Christ. You are a new creation. Peace and mercy upon all those who walk according to that rule. The pattern here that Paul lays out is called indicative that drives imperative. Let me amplify the indicative is what Christ, what God and what Christ has accomplished in your life. What is true of you, it indicates who you are. The reality of who you are as a believer, as a Christian, that's an indicative. An imperative is a command or an exhortation that you must follow through because of who you are and what you are. And this is the pattern of New Testament sanctification and holiness. If you ever wonder, how shall I live the Christian life? Indicative, driving, imperative. One theologian said it this way, if you have, if you have only indicatives, the knowledge of who you are in Christ, but no imperatives, no command, no exhortation. You know what it will lead to? It will lead to antinomianism. An irresponsible living of the Christian life. A loose, lackadaisical, irresponsible living because there's no commandments or exhortations. On the other hand, if there is only an overemphasis on exhortation and imperative commands and exhortations but little indicatives you know what that leads to and fosters legalism and works of the flesh you need that balance and you see this in the new testament the balance look at a few verses past our focus text colossians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 look at what paul says Here's the imperative. It is a command. It is an exhortation. Verses 8 and 9 of Colossians 2. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to the human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. That is an imperative. That's a command. You are not to allow anyone to kidnap you with false doctrine. 
Look at the indicative. Here's the indicative, verses 9 and 10. For, you see the connecting word for? That's the indicative. It is based on this truth. For in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In other words, you are complete in him. The indicative is you are complete in a sufficient and full Christ what else do you need? Who else do you need? If he is Lord and he's, he is providing all that you need, what more do you need? You see, and the Colossians were not convinced of the fullness of Christ. This is their open and vulnerability to false teachings and doctrines. See, if you begin with an incomplete Christ, a Christ that is not full as Paul is describing him here, you will feel inadequate. You will feel in need of feeling the lack with something else outside of Christ. And therefore Paul says, no, don't let anything else influence you for Christ is full. He is the full Savior and Lord. That's all you need. You are complete in Him. In him. Rico and I, several weeks ago, drove to Florida. <laughs> and we spent three days driving. And I made sure my gas tank was full. <laughs> Some Christians, they're comfortable driving on a long pilgrimage and journey with half a tank of gas. The difference is in Christ, he is full. And his fullness does not run out. Like the Everetti uh, commercial, yeah, he keeps going on and on. And you might have to stop and be refreshed and be replenished in his resource. But he is a full Christ. He has a fullness that will never run out for the rest of your Christian life. In him, you are complete. Your openness to other influences is because you do not realize your completeness in Christ. Is he that Lord that you received, that you took alongside to be that Lord along you, alongside of you for the rest of your life? Well, then walk in that fullness. The beginning of your Christian life is to be endowed with that fullness. Not, uh, well, I received a little bit of Christ and hopefully as I mature years from now, I might gain that fullness. According to the apostle, you are already complete in him. Walk in that fullness. Isn't this what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1? Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. He says in verse 3 to 8, I won't read the whole passage, but in verses 3 and 4 are the indicatives of what is true of you already. It's already accomplished. It's already true. You have a full tank for the rest of your pilgrimage and journey. Look at what Peter says. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. That's the indicative. That is true of you. That's your full tank. You are complete. He's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. And look at verse 5. Here's the imperative. He gives you the indicative first and now the imperative. Now the command. For this very reason. What reason? The reason that you have all things that pertain to life and godliness by the power, by the divine power. And you have all these great precious promises by which you will be a partaker for this very reason, here's the exhortation, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and so on with all the other fruits of godliness. But when Peter says supplement your faith, 
He does not mean take something extraneous to Christ and the gospel. You know what he's saying? He's saying the same thing Paul said to the Philippians. If God is working in you this salvation, work out your salvation. Because God is working in you. And God has worked in you and has given you fullness. You work out your faith. That's what he means by supplement your faith. Work it out. Exercise it so that it comes to fruition. You see the indicative and the imperative. This is the New Testament pattern of sanctification and holiness. This is how you walk in the Lord. So Paul lays down this indicative imperative as you have received Christ your Lord, the Lord, so walk in Him. Now what he does, this is still the same sentence in verse 7. Let's come to verse 7. Look at verse 7. In the same sentence, after he says, walk in the Lord as He is your Lord. Walk in Him. Rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. What Paul does here is he gives four attendant conditions or realities that signify Christ's lordship in your life. What do I mean by that? They're not instrumental means by which Christ becomes your Lord. If he is your Lord, these four areas must be attended, must accompany your witness and your testimony. And here they are. The first two are metaphorical. He uses an agricultural or horticultural metaphor rooted in him. That's an agricultural metaphor rooted in him. Secondly, he uses a construction or architectural metaphor built up in him. Thirdly, he says, established in the faith as you have been taught. And fourthly, abounding in thanksgiving. If Christ is Lord, these four areas have to be present in your life. Rooted in him, the agricultural metaphor has to do with growth. It is the growth dimension of Christ's Lordship. If you have been planted and rooted by Christ... You should be growing, and you should be growing not only in deeper roots, but also in fruitfulness. Built up in him is the corporate dimension of Christ's lordship. Corporate, what do I mean by corporate? The word Paul uses there for build up is not, it's not an individual building up. It is a corporate. You're being built up together with other believers. Sorry, but there is no lone ranger in the kingdom. There's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. You are being built up in corporate fashion with other believers. That means if you're not in a body, if you're not planted, if you're not solidly rooted in a corporate body, something is wrong with Christ's lordship. That's the corporate dimension. And then, thirdly, established in the faith, as you have been taught, if Christ is Lord, guess what? He's your master teacher. You are his disciple. You are a learner. No one comes to Christ unless Christ teaches him. No one progresses in the faith unless you are learning and he is teaching you. That's the pedagogical dimension of Christ's lordship. And then fourthly, if Christ is Lord, you better be abounding in praise and worship and thanksgiving. A thankless believer is signifying something is wrong with Christ's lordship in his life. If Christ is Lord, you are abounding in praise and worship. This is the doxological dimension of his lordship. Now, some quick comments about the participles that Paul uses. These four attendant conditions that Paul uses. The first three, rooted in him, built up in him, established, rooted, built up, and established, are all in the passive voice. You know what passive means? Passive means primarily God is doing something to you. 
You are the recipient of a work. You do not plant yourself. You do not build God's house. You do not establish. God is the one doing these three things in you. Yes, you are responding to his rooting and his building up and his establishing by teaching. You are responding. You have a responsibility. But he primarily is the active agent. You are passive in this. The only active one is the last one, abounding. See, God is not the one abounding in thanksgiving. You are the one. You are the active agent in giving praise and worship. Another thing to note is this. Of the four participles, rooted, built up, established, and abounding, rooted is the only perfect The others are present tense. They're ongoing. God is ongoing in building his house. He is ongoing in teaching and establishing you in the faith. You are ongoing in praising and worship. Rooted is not ongoing. Rooted happened once and for all. My wife recently transplanted a plant that she thought needed some boost. And lo and behold, the plant is dying. And we were thinking, well, maybe it was shocked because of the transplant. Well, God doesn't do that to his people. You'll see in the word, when he plants you, he plants you. It's done. It's once and for all. He doesn't plant you and replant you and replant you and replant you. Like some Christians think, you know, I need to be, I need to be replanted again. I need to rededicate my life and come to Christ again and again and again and again with many altar calls to respond to. No, Christ, God plants you once and for all. It's in the perfect tense. It is an established thing. Now with that out of the way, unfortunately for our remaining time, I can only expound on the first attendant condition. And this is going to take up the rest of our time this morning. The horticultural, agricultural metaphor of being rooted in him. The Greek word that Paul uses is the word rhizu. It means to root, to plant, or to cause, to take root, or to strengthen something by planting and letting its roots go down deep. This is why, this is the growth dimension of your Christian faith. This has to do with growth. And uh, this word rizu is used only two times in the New Testament. Here in Colossians 2 verse 7. And the only other place it's used is by Paul. When he prays for the Ephesians in chapter 3 verse 17. Look at what he says. Chapter 3 verse 17, Ephesians. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love. That's the word rizu. That you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. What Paul is implying there is unless there is a rooting and unless you have been planted in a, in a particular manner, You have no strength. You will not have strength to progress, even to comprehend with the rest of the saints the greatness of the love of God and the grace of God. Unless God roots you, you don't have stability to go on in the faith and comprehend things that are ahead of you. That you may be rooted and grounded. And I'll come back to this verse later on. But rooted, as I said, is a passive perfect participle. Happened once for all. It's passive in that you don't plant yourself. Look at, look at um, how the scriptures use the agricultural metaphor. This metaphor is very rich in salvation history. In the Old Covenant, look at this agricultural metaphor in Isaiah 5 verses 1 through 7. This is the picture of how the Lord planted his people under the old covenant. Look at what it says. Let me sing for my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it, cleared it of stones, planted it with choice vines. 
He built a watchtower in the midst of it, hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judea, uh, Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, I will, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hold, or and briars and thorns shall grow up. And I will also command the clouds that there rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is... The house of Israel and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. God planted Israel, God planted the men of Judah, and they yielded wild fruit, not the fruit that God was looking for. Israel failed under the old covenant. Why? It was dependent on their obedience, dependent on their faithfulness, dependent on them to fulfill the covenant requirements. Under the old covenant, God required it of them, and Israel failed. Israel wants to foreshadow the coming of a true Israel. Israel failed under the old covenant. And Jesus said in Matthew 21 to the unbelieving Jews, because you have not produced the fruits, I will take the kingdom from you and give it to a people who will produce its fruits. See the agricultural metaphor there? Then you come to the New Testament, John chapter 15. This was read in your hearing this morning. John 15, verses 1 through 6. I am the true vine. You see, Israel and Judah was the choice vine that God planted in his vineyard, but they failed. That was all to anticipate the coming of the true vine. Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you're clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. That's the agricultural metaphor. That is the people of God planted under the new covenant. The difference is you are planted in the true vine. He is the vine. All those that abide in him and he in them will bring forth fruit to God's glory. There will be no failure. All those that seem to be in him but do not produce fruit will be thrown away, cast into the fire. That's judgment. Under the new covenant, God plants his people in the true vine. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You see the agricultural metaphor again. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 5 through 9. Look at what Paul says. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted. Apollos watered. But God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. But only God who gives gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. Notice what Paul says, you are God's field. In other words, you're God, you are the garden. You're the planting of the Lord. And he uses now also the construction metaphor. You are not only God's field, you are God's building. So Paul is the only one that uses the agricultural metaphor and the construction metaphor, which he's going to get to in Colossians 2 verse 7. You are God's field or garden, God's planting. You are God's building. That's the New Testament picture of God's people. So let me, let me come to three implications 
regarding being rooted in him. Here are the three implications. Salvation is a sovereign planting. That's the first implication. No one plants himself in God's field and God's garden. As the Lord, God saves his people by planting his people in his garden, in his kingdom, in his house. Whoever is not planted by the Lord will be uprooted in judgment. Let me show you some scriptures. Isaiah 60 verse 21. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever. The branch of my planting. The work of my hands that I may be glorified. Look at Isaiah 61 verse 3. To grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. That they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Look at Psalm 92, verses 12 to 15. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the, where? In the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now Jesus said this in Matthew 15 verse 13. Every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Salvation is a planting of the Lord. You are either planted in his courts, in his garden, in his kingdom, or you're not. Whoever is not planted by my heavenly father, Jesus said, will be rooted up. That's judgment. Secondly, being rooted in Christ means that life and growth comes from an organic union and communion. Salvation here is pictured as an organic union and connection. What do I mean by organic? The parts of this building are put together and held together, not organically. The parts do not grow into each other. They're mechanically connected by screws and nails and bolts. Same way with an automobile. It's a mechanical connection. An organic connection, the parts grow into each other. And by being rooted, the plant, when it is rooted in the soil, somehow the life-giving property of the soil starts to infiltrate and move through the plant and its roots. There is an, a, a mutual indwelling and abiding in this metaphor of planting. So that's why it's an organic union. Here is Paul's grand doctrine of the union of the believer. An organic union of the believer with Christ. The believer, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. There is an organic union and communion. Jesus can say, you in me and I in you. Interestingly, there is a mutual abide. If you are in the spirit, the spirit is in you also. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God is in you. There is a mutual abiding. That is what this metaphor of planting communicates. And thirdly, being rooted in Christ results in stability and fruitfulness. We all learn from the parable of the sower that one type of believer did not have roots, was shallow. And because of that, when trials and tribulations came, he could not sustain himself and he withered and died and fell away. Why? He did not have roots. How deep are your roots in Christ? How deep are your roots in the faith? Stability comes from the depth of your roots. Are you rooted in Christ? Are your roots growing deeper? And as it grows deeper, it adds stability, but not only stability, fruitfulness. 
Now let me come to the last portion. I'm going to try and go through these points. Some areas in which believers are rooted and planted in the Lord. There may be more, but uh, let me give you six. In my meditations and study, I think I kind of came up with six areas that signify the union of the believer with Christ. Here's the first one. If Christ is your Lord, He roots you in His Word. He roots you in His Word. Roots you deeply so that in His Word, you are stable, you're unshakable. Look at Psalm chapter 1. Very famous Psalm, Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers, but his delight is in the law, the Torah, the word, day and night. In the law he meditates day and night. Look at what he, look at what he becomes. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and his and its leaves does not wither in all that he does he prospers but look at the look at the contrary condition the wicked are not so but are like chaff that the wind drives away the wicked does do not have stability and substance they're driven away by the wind. The winds of deception, the winds of the world's influence, the winds of God's judgment. They will be blown away like chaff. But the man who is planted deep in the word is like a plant. Stable, unshakable. Are you planted and rooted deeply in the word? If Christ is the Lord of your life, he roots you and plants you deeply in the word. Here's the next one. Secondly, he roots you in his death, his resurrection, and his exaltation. Romans 6 verse 5, Paul says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. The King James Version translates the word united as planted. He uses the King James uses the agricultural term, for if we have been planted. In the Greek, it's the word symphitos. It means planted together. It's the agricultural word. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Hmm. You have been planted in Christ's death. Paul could say to the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's the result of being planted in Christ's death. He says that later on in Galatians, I will not boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus by which the world is crucified to me and I to the world. He has died to the world. In its influencing and dominating power. Why? He is planted in the death of Christ. Paul says in Romans 6, If Christ died unto sin once, you likewise have died to sin. Not to indwelling sin. But you have died to sin's lordship and dominion and reign in your life so that you do not need to obey it. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. That you should obey it in its lust and desires. Romans chapter 6. If you died with Christ. And Paul will say this to the Colossians. If you died with Christ. Why is it that you are still alive and influenced by the elemental spirits of the world? You should, you should be dead with Christ. Why if being planted with Christ is his death not evident in your life right now? Are you living as those who are dead to the dominion and lordship of sin? Even though remaining sin is there, even though remaining sin still plagues you, you are not in bondage and enslaved to its lordship. You have a different lord. Likewise, the resurrection. You've been planted in his resurrection. Paul will go on to say in Colossians chapter 3, If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things which are above, not the things on the earth. Set your minds on things above, 
where Christ is. You died and your life is hidden with Christ. Where? In God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Therefore, mortify your members upon the earth. You see how Paul applies his union with Christ in his death, in his resurrection, in his glorification. Paul lived as he was rooted and planted in the heavenly places in Christ. He lived in a manner in which he was planted together in Christ's death, in Christ's resurrection, in Christ's exaltation. Here's the third one. Are you rooted in the spirit or are you in the flesh? Romans 8 verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Are you rooted in the flesh or in the spirit? If you are a planting of the Lord, folks, the good news is you're not in the flesh. Even though the flesh there does not mean your mortal body. It means humanity under the dominion and lordship of this present evil age. You're not planted there. In fact, in, first, in the first chapter of Colossians, he says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred, I would like to say, transplanted you into the kingdom of his dear son. You have been transplanted into the kingdom. You're no longer planted in this age. Even though you're still in your mortal body. Paul could say to the Galatians, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. If you're walking in the Spirit, yes, you will produce the fruits of the Spirit. Not perfectly, but you will produce predominantly the characteristic in your life is you will produce the fruits of the Spirit. Let me go on. You're not only rooted in his death, in his resurrection. You're not only rooted in his word. You're not only rooted in his spirit. But if Christ is Lord, you are rooted in the new creation, in the heavenly Jerusalem, and in the heavenly kingdom. He said already in chapter 1 of Colossians, He has delivered you from the domain of darkness and has transferred you into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, many times we think of kingdom as something present here. It is, but not in its consummate form. But listen, primarily you are rooted in a heavenly kingdom, a kingdom that has not yet come. It is coming, but has not yet come. You are rooted in a heavenly Jerusalem. Remember Paul said to the Galatians, the Jerusalem above is the mother of us all. Therefore, we are born as free men because our mother, the heavenly Jerusalem, is the free woman, not Hagar, who is in bondage until today, but Sarah, who is a type of or, or signify the heavenly Jerusalem. That is the mother of us all. That means you are born. You are born in the heavenly Jerusalem. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, You have come unto Mount Zion. Where? Unto the heavenly Jerusalem. Not one day you will come. No, you have already come. In spirit, you have been planted there unto an innumerable company of angels, unto the assembly of the firstborn in heaven who are registered and rolled in heaven. You have come to that heavenly kingdom. That's why Jesus could say to the disciples who were rejoicing that the demons were subject to them. He said, don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you. Rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven. You are enrolled in heaven. You were born from the Jerusalem above. Your birth certificate is in heaven. You are enrolled as a citizen in heaven. And therefore, the patriarchs in Hebrews chapter 11, when they were going about seeking for a country whose builder and maker is God, you know what they were seeking for? Their 
heavenly country. Why? They were birthed there. They are citizens there. They are rooted and planted there. And therefore, you know what was their attitude in this world? We are strangers and exiles in the earth. Read about that in Hebrews chapter 11. They considered themselves strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Why? They are rooted and planted in a heavenly kingdom. It's not yet, but it has already begun. One theologian said it this way. I like what he said. Paul always reasoned from the future back into the present. He always reasoned. He started with the end in mind because he knew he was rooted and planted in the future. And so the future determined the present. This is called inaugurated eschatology. He lived in the now because he was planted and rooted in the not yet. Yes, the kingdom is coming, not in its fullness, but it has already begun right now. And he reasoned back, I'm planted, I'm rooted there, and this is how I'm going to live my life now. As in the not yet, I'm rooted and planted, I'll live it as it is now. I am to be what I am becoming. <laughs> Interestingly, he reasoned from the future back into the present. This is called inaugurated eschatology. Eschatology means the last things. It has already begun. Another evidence that you are bearing fruits that belong not to this age, but to the age to come. Remember in Romans chapter 8? It says that all creation is groaning and travailing. And Paul says, we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We're groaning for that ultimate consummation of redemption. What are the first fruits? The first fruits are the first of a harvest that is coming. The Spirit is the earnest. The Spirit is the first installment of the very consummate end. It is the first pledge of what you're going to receive when Christ comes back. Well, you already are bearing first fruits. And so the fruits that you're bearing right now in the present actually are rooted, grounded, planted, and are stemming from the life of the age to come. That's wild. Wrap your head around that. That is pretty wild. The fruits of the Spirit that you produce now, they're coming from the age to come, the powers of the age to come. Let me close with the next Next two points, stay with me on this. Are you rooted in the new creation? Are you rooted in the heavenly Jerusalem? Are you rooted in the heavenly kingdom? But listen, are you rooted in the faith of the patriarchs? In Romans chapter 11, Paul had a sobering word to the Gentile believers in Rome. You know, they thought they, they were so receptive to God and unfortunately God broke off the natural olive branches which resembled the Jews, cast them away and Paul said, listen, in Romans, Romans chapter 11 verse 17 and 18, Paul said, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. In other words, the Jews. If you are, remember, and here's the important statement. Remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Now, Paul is using agricultural metaphor. You were grafted into this nourishing olive root, olive tree, the natural branches, the unbelieving Jews were broken off. You, a wild olive tree, were fortunately grafted into this nourishing root. Who's the nourishing root? Commentator Douglas Moo said, and I, I, I agree with him, the root is the faith, the promises that God instituted with the patriarch. Where did the Jewish people come from? Came from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The covenant God made with them. The grace that God gave to them. This is the nourishing root. And it is still nourishing you Gentile believers unto this day. 
That means the faith of Abraham, the faith of Isaac, the faith of Jacob, the faith of the men of old, the patriarchs, the forefathers of the faith. They're still nourishing the New Testament saints today. So every time Pastor Christian comes up here and preaches from Genesis, he is developing your historical roots. And the greater your roots, the deeper your roots in understanding the history of your faith, the stronger you are in the faith. Why study the, the faith of the Old Testament saints? Why? The faith has been around longer than you. And that is Paul's message to the Roman Christians. Don't be arrogant because the Jews don't believe. God is able to graft them back in. And furthermore, you don't support the root. The root supports you. The faith of the forefathers that started with Abraham and the patriarchs, that is what supports your faith today. Don't think you're the new kid on the block that has everything from God. They're men of God. They walked in this longer than you. And this is the relevance of studying historical theology, biblical theology, and even the theology of the saints in the Old Testament. Do you have historical roots? The deeper your roots, the stronger and more stable you are. Those who have a history of, and an understanding of the history of their faith can make connections that others cannot make. Why? They have deep root systems. Stable, strong. Let me end with this one. This is my sixth point. If you think that was great, Paul went even further than that. Paul went even further than that. Look at what he says to the Galatians. In Galatians 1 verse 15. But when he who had set me apart... Before I was born, and who called me by his grace, and was pleased to reveal his son in me that he might preach the gospel. Notice what Paul says. He separated me before I was born. Paul was not a Christian when he was a little infant. and Before he was born. What is Paul saying? Paul said to Timothy, Paul said to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus. When? Before the ages. Do not make light of the doctrines of sovereign grace. God's foreknowledge. God's election. God's predestination. Those are roots to your faith that go even beyond. They transcend history. They go into eternity. Paul's faith was anchored and planted and rooted in the eternal counsels. Of God's love. That's why he could say to the Romans. Whom he foreknew. Them he predestined. To be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be preeminent among many brethren. And whom he predestined. Them he called. And whom he called. Them he justified. And whom he justified. Them he glorified. And at the end of chapter 8. He said therefore. I am persuaded. That neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power. Nothing in this created order or in the world to come can ever separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I believe he was referring to the love of God given to him in Christ Jesus in the eternal counsels. In other words, beyond history, in eternity. He was rooted and planted in the love of God. In the eternal counsels and purpose of God. It was given to him in Christ before the ages. Are you rooted? Do you have historical roots? Are your roots that deep? As Paul said his was. Can you stand and be persuaded that nothing shall separate you from the love of Christ? Because you have that kind of rooting and planting in the Lord. Amen. Let's close in prayer.
Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that as our Lord, you have planted and rooted us into your kingdom, into your courts, into your house, even into your son, Jesus Christ, that his life may be ours, that the glory and the virtue of your spirit working in us, in whom we have been planted and rooted, may bear fruit even in this age, fruits that belong to another age. Thank you, Father. May you seal the word now to each of us, and if anyone in here is not persuaded that they are planted and rooted in Christ, may you convict their hearts. As Jesus said, whichever plant was not planted by my heavenly Father shall be rooted out. May you convict their heart, and may you work in them that they might be rooted and planted in Christ. Thank you, Father. Seal the word now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.